Welcome to the DTS Fitness Education Podcast. My name is Ben McDonald and I am proud as punch to be here with the main man, the OG of kettlebell lifting, Steve Cotter. How are you, my mate? I'm doing so good. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me on, Ben. It's an absolute pleasure. And I was just saying before we uh, started the recording, like I had Encyclopedia of Kettlebell Lifting Volume 1 and 2. It was like, that was like back in the day, mate. That's serious stuff, you know? Yeah, it goes back. It goes back uh, <laughs> more than a decade. <laughs> so when it comes to that sort of stuff, mate, it's safe to say that you have a little experience, Steve. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I was one of the early, early adapters when the kettlebell phenomenon began in terms of the, the modern uh, kettlebell market. I was one of the very first people and I, um, I took it and went with it and started bringing it around the world and um, still, still teaching, still teaching around the world. In fact, I just got back from a two week tour in Asia where I was introducing kettlebells to uh, Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, Hong Kong. So yeah, I, I, I go back to the early days for sure. But, but the good thing is I'm still involved. I still am using kettlebells, still teaching, still loving the uh, practicality. So it's all about the, the doing of it. Exactly my mate. And I know that it was a big influence on me and a big influence on the stuff that uh, I know that a lot of people taught and worked with uh, sort of at the time, mate, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that now is, uh, it has to be in your toolbox. If you're, if you're a trainer, if you're involved in fitness, if you're involved in strength training, you know, the kettlebells is as ubiquitous as a barbell now. You know, yeah, definitely. I would, I would agree with that hundred uh, percent. I, and uh, I spoke to, we had Brett Jones on from strong first uh-huh. and I was, I was talking to him about, it's crazy how it used to be because some of the questions that we've got, it's like when it comes to unconventional training, it's like the unconventional stuff is now conventional. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The unconventional is, uh, what's new is old or what's old is new. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever way you sort of want to look at it, you know what I mean? All right, Steve, let's get started. Let's get started. Uh, question number one. When it comes to unconventional training, what are your top pieces of equipment and why? Most important equipment is the human body. So that's the foundation of everything because any tool is an extension of the hand. And it only can be directed by the director, which is your mind and body. So, so basically a tool is only as useful as the mechanism that is driving it. And um, so when I say the body, you have to be uh, well grounded in your, in your body weight movement, in your basic fundamental body weight movements. And uh, so that's the starting point to all training from there. I'm very preferential toward the kettlebell. Uh, the kettlebell is, you know, it's a handheld tool. Um, it's designed in a way that is very versatile in terms of the physical characteristics that it's developing. And, and by that, I mean, it's not, it's not focusing on one quality such as strength. Rather, it's an interaction and mixture of strength as well as mobility, as well as endurance, as well as power. So it's a very versatile, uh, it's more towards the endurance side of things, and then the creativity component as well. So you have a, a wide array of ways of using the kettlebell, manipulating the positions to change the leverage. That's really the versatility of it. And the third, uh, the third piece really for me is, um, again, human body, but it's a another person's body so I have my body I have the kettlebell and now I have the other person's body and you know in one context that's martial arts you know so grappling uh, sparring uh, but it also can be you know partner partner exercises partner calisthenics and, and I like all tools but the reason I say say those three is because it's a very low cost in terms of um, time as well as money you know, you got your body, 
you got your training partner, you got your kettlebell, you don't need anything above and beyond that. You don't need even a gym membership. You just need a place to stand, you know? So, um, those are, those are for me where I am now, but you know, you asked me five years ago or you asked me five years from now, those answers could change, but the body is always, is always the first answer. Mate, I find that, I find that really interesting because it's, I think you speak to people who've been around the industry for an extended period of time and the answers that they give just get so much more refined and almost straightforward. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, all you need is a kettlebell, yourself and your mate. That's it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. And, and it's uh, full circle. Um, but, but universal, I think the more experience we get, the more, the more universal uh, we are in our, in, in, because it becomes principle based. Uh, the techniques can change, the tools can change, but the fundamental mechanisms that are the foundation of your program development, those don't really change. You know, those stay the same. So, <clears throat> you know, I would say that, that the body is a, uh, that's an old standby. That's something that's always going to be there and, and it's always readily accessible. It doesn't, it's not contingent upon adding anything else to it. No, I like that, mate. I like that. So that is like unconventional. You've got your body, you've got a kettlebell, and you've got somebody else's body. That's all your base is covered. <laughs> that yes, is fantastic, sir. mate. I like it. All right. That's an excellent, excellent answer, my friend. So let's move on. Question number two. What are your absolute bread and butter movements with a kettlebell, Steve? The swing has to be the foundation because the swing is teaching the fundamental principle of kettlebell, which is inertia. Uh, the principle of inertia, body set in motion, stays in motion. And so the swing is what teaches that and refines that and then from there you can extend into you know clean into snatch which are just expressions of the swing <clears throat> uh have to put a squat in there <clears throat> specific to kettlebell however if you're lifting kettlebells and you're not squatting then you're missing um you know a crucial movement and and i will say that i don't even consider squat an exercise it's a fundamental human movement pattern and certainly if your goal is to get tired, squats can make you tired. <laughs> uh, so we got the swing, we got the squat, and then the third is the overhead. And so that's press. It can also be push press. Um, and, and that's it. So we have a squat, we have a swing, and we have an overhead press. Right. And, okay. and, and you know, I, if you're asking the why, overhead stability, you, you got to reach something, you got to put it up. You got to grab something that's, that's the overhead stability. So you're talking about shoulder health, uh, you know, structural, structural integrity of the, of the upper body. Uh, the swing is, you know, that's posterior chain. That's, that's your, that's your legs, that's your hips, that's your lower back. And then you got your grip and then the squat. Well, that's your, that's your foundation that you're walking on. So strong legs is going a long way towards a strong body. Nice, mate. Nice. And you don't get any more really full body activation than holding something over your head. You know what I mean? Because it's like everything. Yes. In. yes. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to sort of dissect the qualities that, that would be important, you're going to be able to check off, uh, check off pretty much all the boxes with, with these moves. You know, um, you're getting your, your midline stability, you're getting your you know, your triceps, your, your shoulders and the pull, the swing, you're getting your, you know, your grip, your biceps, your, your glutes, your legs, you know, squat that covers everything waist down as well as your, you know, core strength. So, um, yeah, it's all, those are pretty much all inclusive. Question, Steve, it, it, we go, we're going, we're going to go off of the, uh, of the script a little, when it comes to the squat, which is your preferred squat? Would you like? Would you do uh, more of a goblet squat, or would you uh, do more of a rack uh, position squat? What's your preference, or even maybe a, an overhead squat? Uh, well, it's always contextual. The answer for myself, what what I prefer, it could be different than what my preference is for teaching, or yeah. you know. Um, so, but in general. 
more times than not, I'm going to like the over, the goblet squat. Um, but at any point, I, I might also opt for one of the other ones. It really sort of depends on the training goal. The goblet squat is, is easier entry. So yeah. if, as a teaching point, if we're talking about the masses, you know, everybody versus just specializing maybe with an athlete, if we're talking about everybody, the goblet squat is extremely accessible because you pick it up with two hands, you hold it in front of you, arms connected to the body, and now you have that counterbalance. So it's going to facilitate that, that, backward, that backward sitting with your hips, um, which many times folks have difficulty with in terms of balance, in terms of flexibility. So it gives you that nice offset counterbalance which enables the person to more easily sit back and down and be comfortable in that bottom position. And, and I say, you know, a squat is a fundamental resting position. Mm, yeah. Um, as, as compared to something like a deadlift, which is more of a ground reactive force. So, you know, like, like if you forget about exercising, just put it into human movement, human locomotion. Uh, a squat is something that we don't have to be trained how to do. Just look at a baby or look at a child drop their toy, right? They're going to they're gonna go and do a perfect squat and pick it up. You go to a non-developed, you know, or, or what used to be called a third world nation, and you go out into the rural areas. And even today in the, you know, 21st century, we're going to see people sitting in a full squat, working in the fields or, you know, so... A squat is really a, a resting position. Before we had chairs, <laughs> humanity was was pretty much squatting. Yeah, I, I think uh, like in in the course that we sort of deliver our mate our. Uh, foundation or the foundation of all the other courses, our DTS level one, we talk about the uh, the squat as a human rest position. We talk about like uh, knee replacements and hip replacements are catching up very quick uh, to the knee replacement. But if you look at like um, uh, countries like like what you were saying, like uh, third th third world, yeah. as we used to call them. Mm -hmm. very very low rates of um knee replacement and hip replacement and these yeah are they don't have back pain and, and you know they're not sitting in chairs and cars and toilets and and uh, sofas you know they're 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 moving and and so yeah there's something that can be lost as the world becomes modernized and we gain more technological conveniences is that there is a price for that and one of the main prices that we're dealing with in society is, is less and less movement, less and less mobility. And so now we have to have exercise and fitness to sort of counteract the deleterious effects of modern lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, and I think... And, and so, gob you know, anyway, to, I, I <laughs> was very extensive in my answer, but in the short form, goblet squat is my preference. Nice. Of those three, yeah. Nice, mate. Nice. I think um, uh, just to touch on just to touch on that topic that you that you that you just touched on there, Steve. I think uh, people get a little conf get it a little backwards sometimes, where they focus on the gym getting them better at the gym, whereas really the gym should be getting them better at life. That's I agree with you on that. You know, to each their own, and we do have phases of life. So you know, I think it's normal that what the 18, the 20 year old is looking to achieve, it probably is going to be very different than maybe what the 45 or 50 year old is looking to achieve, you know, and I would hope so. I would hope that our priorities and our goal and our focus changes uh, as we develop over life, you know, so it's not for me to say what's right or wrong about that, because yeah. as long as someone has a goal and it's, if it's about building the, if it's curls for the girls or whatever the goal is, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. But at some point in time, we have to get to the point where we realize that now I'm looking at the rest of my life. And so how do I want to live out those years? And, you know, so now we start looking at pain-free, pain you know, ease of motion, uh, performance, and daily activities. You know, being able to enjoy your life without breaking down as opposed to maybe a younger person might be thinking about some type of sport performance or some type of aesthetic uh, objective, you know. But I think um, 
like, if you look at me, Steve, obviously you can have both. Do you know what I mean? You know, hey, so it's that, it's that sharp dressed man right there. <laughs> Brilliant, my mate. Brilliant. Excellent insight, my friend. All right. So question number three, what would be your top tips for improving more ballistic movements? And where would you see these fitting into a client's program? Uh, well, there's nothing to it but to do it. <laughs> you know, so as far as ballistic lifts, I think the best way to to enter into those and train them is, is to perform the ballistic lifts. And so there's no way that I'm aware of that we can really um, isolate the development of ballistics without actually performing ballistics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so so really, I'd say it's more a matter of understanding what we're trying to achieve and how we're connecting the body to be able to express those ballistic movements in a way that is, you know, powerful and safe. And, you know, so it is dynamic in the sense. And so there is, if someone is not familiar with the ballistics, it can be intimidating because you see there's a lot of force, there's a lot of speed. And so, you know, it would be predicated on having a strong foundation. So it may not be the starting point for a lot of people. They may need to develop a, a certain balance, you know, a certain stability in your core sort of grinding lifts, for example, a deadlift, a squat, a, a heavy press. So now you have some, some body integrity and, and then now we can move into the ballistics and give it, give it that full expression. Uh, but, but honestly, I think the kettlebell is again, the kettlebell is a tool that uh, gives availability to the ballistics it a much easier entry point compared to something like Olympic lifting, yeah. which is much more specialized, which requires a, a more well-developed uh, specific flexibility. You know, an office worker, if, if they've been sitting at a desk for 30 years and haven't been really training full range of motion, you don't want that person doing an, a, a, a snatch or an overhead squat with an Olympic bar. They're simply not ready. And if you try to force them into that, it's going to create problems and compensations yeah. sooner rather than later. Whereas with a kettlebell, I don't need to have a lot of training and I can sort of just do a swing. And now there's, there's my first taste of a real ballistic movement, but it's something that is manageable and there's not as much uh, complexity to doing it. If you do it wrong, as long as you're not, you know, as long as you're not going too fast or doing too much weight, if, even if you do it wrong, uh, there's not as much of a risk of really jacking yourself up compared to doing ballistics with, say, an Olympic bar, which the uh, risk ratio becomes higher. Yeah. Great. So we just want to make sure that you've got that solid foundation yeah. prior and, to getting into anything like that. And so pro maybe your question was coming more as far as we need to we need to be able to express full a hip extension. That's one component. So in terms of the ballistics, we need to be able to have that extension. You know, again, it's the triple extension. And, and I even, I talk about the quadruple extension because that's actually more accurate because we have ankle, knee, hip, torso extending, you know, and so you're in your ballistic lifts, you're going to have that extension. And so that the hip flexors need to be open. You need to be able to fully extend the hips and so that might mean you need to do some mobility and preparation before you work on, you know, that hip extension. So, so that's definitely one point. And then your shoulder head over overhead um, mobility in terms of being able to fixate lock out, you know, first a single arm and then later both arms overhead. Um, that's going to have to do with your neck, your, your, your thoracic spine, your shoulder girdle and developing sufficient, uh, mobility in those positions. And then, you know, from there you increase the stability through progressive overload and, you know, a, a smart training structure. Fantastic, mate. Fantastic. So that, that's going to lead us directly into the next question. So what are your top tips for improving more grind movements and where would you see those fitting into a client's program? Same thing. Um, well, not the same. Some of the things are the same, but but in terms of the, it's not the same in the sense that the grinding is a is a slow, 
grind, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, everything, everything is, is locked up. And then, you know, a ballistic is a, is a fast speed. So, so a grind is going to be heavier than the ballistic for the most part. Um, so yeah, your stance, uh, your stance, your definitely hip, hip mobility is, is also important there. Um, as far as the, the, if you're asking me the top three lifts or, or you ask me for the tips. Tips. Top yeah. tips, my mate. Yeah. Well, well, maximal, um, being able to recruit tension, you know, so, um, the irradiation to use that term, but, but to, to be able to crush the bar in your hand, to be able to, uh, radiate full body connectivity, you know, so your, your glutes, your abs, your grip, uh, being able to squeeze and recruit tension throughout the whole body as opposed to just isolating uh, an area of your body or a single joint. That's going to be crucial as well. Um, and then management of your breathing. So the breathing is going to be different with the, with the grinding movements. The breathing is going to be more of a what might be called a power breathing, even, even in many cases using that Vasalva maneuver where you're – taking a deep breath and sort of holding it through the first part of the movement, to, you know, once it gets moving and then whew, releasing. Uh, so, so the breathing is key. Uh, full body tension is key. And then like everything else, your, your posture, your structure, you know, so, so be, having an upright position, having your shoulders packed, uh, you know, being able to, to stand upright and keep your midline, stable not not kind of shifting around and, and moving while you're trying to execute the lift excellent mate i like that uh, on um, on our course we talk about the skill of strength being the ability to create maximal or the ability to create tension yes yes that's a good way to look at it for sure <laughs> and if you say that mate i am i am having it you know I am who, who am it. i to argue who am i to argue with what works i mean it, it's it's just about reinforcing if something's true it's true so i i accept i don't have to be the originator of a concept in order to embrace it you know <laughs> do you know what i i think in the health and fitness fitness industry mate I think pretty much everyone is standing on the shoulders of giants. You know what I mean? It's like everything just goes around in a in a circle, and a, and that's how it sort of uh, how you see it sort of progress. Yeah, in life in general, you know, it's uh, the, most of the things have been done before, and you know, we can put different angles on things, but there's very few things that come along that are there in the way of technology. Certainly, you know, I mean, we can say that you know the internet did not exist, you know, <laughs> in the recent you know, but, but those are exceptions for the most part when we're talking about certainly fitness, but most things in life, as you say, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There's work that came before us and we have to leverage that. And then when we can, we add to it or we make it our own. Yeah, very much. I very much, I very much agree with you, mate. Very much agree with you. Okay. So question number five, what modalities of training do you find really complement kettlebells? So it could be body weight, barbell, mace, clubs, anything like that, that you sort of find, Oh, do you know what? I always, I always utilize this with this, you know, is there anything well, like that? Definitely martial arts. Definitely. Um, you know, not maybe one more than the other, but I think especially grappling. Uh, I really love the jiu-jitsu, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So that's so very complimentary for a lot of reasons. Um, obviously, conditioning, um, but, but grip, finger grip especially, um, as opposed to forearm grip. So the finger grip is directly transferable. If you're training kettlebell, it directly transfers into, especially you know, using gi, if you're, if you're grappling with gis, uh, same type of grip. So, so that's really complimentary. And, and then just the, the strength and the structural integrity that I've developed over the years uh, with the kettlebell from just um, consistent, you know, volume over time, uh, developing the, the, you know, developing the tendon structures and uh, building a lot of, a lot of kind of body connectivity. And, and that's always good because you're harder to kill, <laughs> 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 you know, so, um, 
I always are going to go again, it's body weight. And then from there, other real compliments, definitely some kind of club that could be a mace. Uh, that could be a, a club bell. It could also be an Indian club, but having a lever extending the weight outside of your body, that's really complimentary. It's going to, it's going to bring in different kinds of angles and especially the club is going to be very much upper body dominance, you know, so your wrist, your elbows, your shoulders, um, for health, for shoulder health, as well as strength. Uh, so I think a club is one of the most, uh, complimentary. And then, um, you know, it's really choose your poison. I, I really believe that it's the thing you're going to do is a better choice than the thing that is better that you're just talking about, <laughs> you know? So at the end of the day, um, you can have the best tool in the world, but if it's sitting there collecting dust, you're not absorbing the benefit from it. So, yeah. um, I don't really differentiate if, if you love the barbell, it's the barbell. If you prefer the sandbag, it's that, if it's the Bulgarian bag, if it's the heavy ropes, they're all good. And I don't think one's better than the other. I think it's the one you're going to do that you're going to get results until, until you don't get results anymore, then you can switch it. So, um, on any given day, it's like, whatever is there, that's the one, <laughs> whatever, you know, cause it's all good. Right. Yeah, and we yeah. can't do everything at, at once and we can't be great at all things. So at some point we're still going to choose. And I like tools that give more bang for the buck in terms of versatility. That's why I start with kettlebell. Um, because it's a lot more versatile than most other strength training tools. And, um, but, but probably to be honest, a barbell has to, if someone is really interested in developing like maximal strength, the barbell is, you know, it's just, it is what it is. It's you just, you slap weight on it and you keep getting stronger. So I don't use a lot of barbells myself. I don't use a lot of barbells, but it's, it's because of my lifestyle. It's because of, uh, it's because of the fact that I'm, you know, when I teach, I'm focusing on teaching kettlebells and I'm traveling a lot. I don't exist in a gym. The only time I step, step in a gym is when I'm teaching a seminar at a host <laughs> facility, you know, cause life, cause my space is the, wherever you are, that's your opportunity to move. It's not contingent upon punching in and punching out um, or going to some meeting place, you know? So for me, it's just for different reasons, the barbell does not fit into my lifestyle. And so for that reason, I don't use a lot of barbell, but that doesn't mean I don't respect the barbell. And certainly if I'm constructing a, a well-rounded strength conditioning program, the barbell is going to be featured in that. Yeah, I like that. I think uh, I like that thought process, Steve, of not punching in, punching out. It's like wherever you are, that is your environment for movement. You know, I think that's quite quite a, a cool concept. Yes, yes. And um, we have been moving longer than we've been doing anything else. The only thing that precedes moving is breathing, which is motion of the breath. So, yeah. you know, everybody breathes. That's the universal that everybody has to do, regardless of your station in life. And then everybody moves. That's the second thing. And then after that, there's a lot of different ways we can go about those things. I like it, mate. That's, uh, that's excellent. Thank you for that. All right. So um, question number six, what is your number one tip? Number one, Steve, number one tip for people who want to get into kettlebell work. Where did he start? What's the big thing? Uh, they need to check out my, my videos. They need to check out my um, instructional materials. It doesn't have to be me. There's other good people. But um, probably step one is going to be your source. Where are you getting the information? And is it good information? Is it reliable information? That's because without that, you're going to go the long way and you're going to go the really long way and you'll eventually figure it out, but you can save yourself a lot of time and you can avoid a lot of uh, mistakes and injuries and things that can be setbacks by just taking, taking a little bit of time to, to 
make sure that your fundamentals are, are solid and you understand what you need to do. Now you can proceed on the program and from there, you don't really need a coach. You can do it at, on your own. Um, but that's really the first step because without that, then it's like, okay, I got this kettlebell. What do I do with it? Oh, I'll curl it <laughs> or, you know, I'll press it, but my hand isn't in the right position. In fact, I don't even know that that's important. I'm not even aware of it. So the kettlebell by itself doesn't do anything it's it's a it's a dead weight and so what brings the if effectiveness is the application you got to get the right technique it's it's no different than if you're going to learn martial arts you're going to learn punching or kicking you need to be taught how to do it correctly um, so that's that's the entry point first and you know nowadays it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be uh, even a huge investment of cost. You know, um, we have just the proliferation of information. That being said, not on, not all information is good information. Yeah. And you can tap in kettlebell and there might be some influencer that's got, you know, several hundred thousand video views. And so you look at them because it's popular and they, maybe their technique is horrible. You know, and they never, you know, and they didn't scroll to the second page. They found my video and I would have set them straight from the beginning. But hey, that's life. You live and learn. That, so, so that's why I say the first thing is to check out my stuff because I give my 100% guarantee that, that the information that I give is good information. And that's really important. Um, so, you know, get good information, a good starting point of the basics. And then, you know, from there, um, there's some mindset, there's this important mindset things. And, and one of the most important things with kettlebell is to take a longer term view, take a longer term view in terms of the progress. And so you're not looking to, to kill it in one day or one week or one month. You're thinking, okay, what am I going to do for the next three months? And then for the next six months, the next year, you know, and that's really, and so what I'm saying is to be patient is really important um, because it's not a, it, you can't just come into and like, oh, I'm a, I'm a strong fit person. So I'm going to pick up the heavy kettlebell and I'm going to do, you know, one rep of the heaviest I can do. That's not what kettlebell lifting is. It's submaximal load done for increasing reps eventually very you know many 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 reps because it's a fixed weight so the way we progress a fixed weight is by increasing the volume the weight isn't going to change now of course you know if i have two kettlebells and if i have <laughs> 10 kettlebells but let's say i don't let's say i just have one so it's never going to get heavier so the only way i'm going to progress is either to change the leverage to make the movement more difficult or i have to increase the speed or I have to increase the reps. Otherwise, you just stay at the same level, right? So it has to be progressive overload. And with kettlebell, the progressive overload is the volume by doing more and more repetitions. Whether that's one set, whether that's more sets, you know, that that's individual how that's structured. But the overall goal, when you look back a year from now and you're consistent in your practice, you'll see that your volume of output is going to be more than what it was a year ago. And if it's not, well, you're, you've been kind of not training enough. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, mate. So you've got first thing is quality information. And then the second thing is set yourself up for the long game. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then, you know, the last thing is, desire it's 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 focus it's you know what do you do why are you doing it and that that reminder is what gets you to keep doing it so consistency is the third thing because because it's through the consistency that we can make lasting change i like it my mate that's that's excellent okay um so steve what has been going on with you my friend what have you got going on at the moment what's happening in steve cotter's life my life is incredibly dynamic, incredibly exciting. And uh, I'm not going to put a hierarchy on this because it's a lot of different things. It's, it's, all, it's all cool stuff. It's all important. 
So I don't want number, you know, the third and fourth things I list to, to feel offended that I didn't choose them first. <laughs> Cause it's just, a, it's just what comes to mind. But, um, you know, first of all, my, my kids are doing great. My family's great. So that's the foundation of everything. Um, you know, they're healthy, they're well-adjusted, they're doing things in their life. So, so awesome there. I'm really happy about that. Um, in terms of my personal practice, I'm really heavily involved in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. My senseis are two of the greatest to ever do it. Uh, you know, Salo and Shanji Hibero. So I'm lucky to be in a lineage of really high level, you know, warriors that, you know, the martial art is who I am. I'm a martial artist and I found the jujitsu two years ago and, you know, it just, I love it. That's my favorite activity. <laughs> uh, reading, I'm reading nonstop, really audio. I discovered audio books earlier this year. So I'm just, I'm just uploading information nonstop because I'm a consummate learner. I, I'm consummate, you know, study. I want to understand things. I want to learn things. I want to gain different perspectives. I want to reinforce my knowledge, you know. So in my waking hours, if 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 duty is not calling, I'm more than likely going to be listening to an audio book, and, and then from there I can do other things simultaneously. But um, so th so there's you know that's kind of my personal lifestyle, and then uh, in terms of my professional work, I'm still teaching. Uh, kettlebell seminars and body weight conditioning, uh, bre breathing exercises, you know, martial art based movement. I'm still doing that. I'm doing that internationally. I, I just, uh, well, when did I get back? Monday night. I was in Asia for two weeks. I was teaching in the Philippines and Cambodia and Vietnam and Hong Kong. So I actually, uh, in both Cambodia and Vietnam, I, I was the first time that an international presenter has come and presented kettlebells in those countries so it's you know that's something that I enjoy doing is I open up kettlebell markets in you know different countries around the world now it's over 60 countries since 2007 when I started doing that wow, you know, wow. so I'm still doing that um, but I love it I love doing it I love and it enables me to learn about the world it enables me to interact with other people other cultures other cuisines and you know see the the sim the, the sameness that that we all have you know the the fundamental things were were more alike than different and you know educating me about the, the the world and not having to rely on you know cnn or time or you know choose your poison literally of where you're getting your information from right so i, I go and i get my information from firsthand experience you know and and i get to do what i love and i get to share my experience and my passion and, and help people and, and you know help give people good information and build, build the strength of that community. And, and, you know, those fitness pros that are learning from me, they take things from that and they bring it into, you know, their students and their clients and the communities they're serving. So it's a, you know, moving forward in this way. And now um, I'm learning to be a businessman <laughs> for the first <laughs> time in my life, you know, and I say that jokingly, but it's true in the sense that, when I started out in this, you know, it wasn't really, I didn't have a business plan in mind. It was just, this is what I enjoy. And oh, hey, I need to eat. I need to take care of my family. So let's figure out how we do this. And, you know, there was no real structure of, you know, and so now with all the experience and making so many mistakes and so learning what not to do has positioned me to understand what to do, <laughs> you know, and, um, you put, you know, you put a thousand shots and you missed the, the first 999. Well, now you made a basket. So now you know how to do it correctly. And from there, you're going to make more baskets, right? So um, it's like that, you know, but I, I now i am got some really interesting things going on. Um, I'm really involved with uh, Weck Method. As a, my, my good friend, David Weck, he's the inventor of the BOSU and BOSU is all around the world and everybody has seen the BOSU or stand on ones. And it's one of the most ridiculed tools because there's a cabal in the fitness industry that likes to make fun of this. And um, the reality is BOSU is a strength training tool. And you got some of the strongest guys in the world that are using it for compression, you know, because you squeeze that as hard as you can. You can't, you can't break it. So you're using lim limit force elastics, you know, and so it's a strength training tool more than anything. And so WEC method, he's, really the in, most innovative guy in the whole world of human performance.
performance in terms of understanding human locomotion. And so now, you know, David and I have been friends for 20 years. In fact, I was helping him when, when he was first came out with the BOSU back in 2000, making it still by hand with duct tape. And, you know, then it's gone on to sell millions and millions all around the world. But I've only, you know, just recently we've made a formal relationship where now I'm working with him, you know, to just grow his method and, and introduce that around the world because he's got some amazing things that all fitness professionals need to learn about. And then one of those things is, is simply the use of ropes, the rolling ropes. And, you know, um, we use the ropes without jumping. And when you understand how to do that, now we start tapping into the power of the figure eights. And the figure eights is the fundamental to the human locomotion because we're, you know, we're quadrupe we're, we're really quadrupedal. And, you know, we, we, we exist primarily, you know, bipedally in terms of walking around, but in terms of our full body mechanics, you know, I don't know how many generations we have to go back, but we all descend from our ancestors back. We're hanging in trees, you know, and then we started, you know, existing on the ground and hunter gathering through the different epochs of humanity, you know, to where we are now. And we're, you know, we're walking around on pristine two dimensional flat ground, but we are not two dimensional beings. And so there's all kinds of foot problems. And, you know, you got these high heel cushiony shoes, you know, the Nikes and the Adidas. And, you know, I don't have anything against any of, of these per se, but they're not doing people well by coming up with these cool looking shoes that do not understand the correct mechanics of the foot. And so you get people exercising, oh, my ankle hurts, my knee hurts, my hip hurts, my whole body's out of whack because I have not aligned my bony skeleton in the way that nature has designed us. And so David is, you know, with the WEC method, that's where we're at and bringing new information where, you know, five years from now, just like, you know, 15 years ago, I saw the kettlebell and I saw that it was going to be everywhere when no one even knew the kettlebell. They looked at what's this steel, you know, that that's not going to go anywhere. And I knew it because it, that's one of my talents is I have a visionary, not on the invention side, but in the terms of the utility side, I'm able to recognize things and see, okay, this is something that is important. This is something that's going to last, you know, what that looks like. I don't really know. I just know that. And I saw that with kettlebell and I see this with WEC method with, with the key concepts there, because it's just, whatever else you're doing, this is going to help you do it better because at the end of it, we're all human animals and there's things about biomechanics that have never before been understood, never before been seen. And even when you're looking at athletics and analyzing, you know, we're looking usually up at sprinters and so on. We're looking from the front view and it's fast. So we, we see, and, and just to give you an example, the industry talks a lot about, you know, anti-rotation and really anti-rotation is a misunderstanding because there is no anti-rotation. Anti-rotation is anti-athletic. And in fact, when you look at the best movers in the world, best athletes, regardless of their sport, we start seeing certain common denominators. And what, what we actually do is we coil our core. We coil our core and it's a figure eight. You know, and if I chop off both arms and both legs and you're gonna move across the floor, the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna, you're gonna figure eight those stubs. You understand what I'm saying? I understand and, where you're and, going, and, yeah. And, and, and that's our human movement. You know, you look at a baby, they're crawling, we're rolling. That's what we're doing. It's, it's a upper and lower body working opposites. And it's a, you know, the nervous system crosses at the midline and it's an X. And that's why, you know, a cross is stronger than a jab. And when we run and when we walk, it's opposition. And, you know, so that's, that's where the WEC method comes in and has a level of have identified. And, and David's a genius in inventing. He's able to invent things that have utility, you know, and just sees things that other people don't see. And, you know, that's part of his genius. So I'm really excited to be working with him. And that starts with the fact that the practice, the personal practice, because I'm using, I'm using the training and I'm doing it. And it makes me move better. So 
you know, so I have that going on and then, you know, um, some educational stuff. I'm going to be doing more things starting this year in Asia in terms of, uh, no details right now. It's a new venture. It's a new venture, but it involves, uh, it involves education of fitness professionals and bringing these professionals into, you know, into certain countries where there's a need for it, where people are working too hard and not moving enough and not getting the education, you know, that meets them at the level that they are so that they can have a life that is enjoyable. It's not just about, you know, just work and, you know, now I, I made my money and now I can't enjoy any of it because I've just been a slave to the corporation. And, you know, so people need to have information about moving and caring for themselves. And, you know, some people call that fitness. I don't really call it fitness. Fitness is so limiting, you know, but it's well being yeah. of which, of which fitness is a component of that certainly. Yeah, I I think that's a phenomenal. Our vision statement for the for our company is longevity and pain free living for everyone, and it used to be longevity and pain free movement, but we just thought that that was a little limiting because you have the mental and emotional aspect as well. Yes, so, and you can have pain emotionally, you can have pain mentally. So we wanted to incorporate absolutely everything in that longevity and pain free living component. So we understand exactly where you're coming that's from. That's fantastic, people. and that's really important. And, and you're right, you know, the pain it's about solutions for pain. There's a lot of people in pain, and as you said, it, it you know, physiologically is an expression, but ultimately, there's a there's a psychosomatic relationship and, and, you know, when we start dig, digging deep and really trying to heal, you know, we have to look at the emotional, we have to look at the, the mental or just how we process information, how we communicate information, both with others, more importantly with ourselves, you know, and then yeah, fitness has a component because we also are dynamic beings and we have to move and we got to keep the machine running. Um, but there's so much that isn't. So I'm really happy to hear you say that, that you're working on that because we need so much more of that. And it goes beyond the, you know, biceps, right? And it's, it's about, as you said, healthful living, pain-free living. 100%, my mate, 100%. Well, I'm I'm glad, mate, that like everything sounds like it's going superb. You know what I mean? Everything's going really well. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and really it all can change in a moment, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so the thing is, is, is gratitude is gratitude and acceptance. Um, you know, it rains, it snows, it's sunny, it's all good. You know, so the, the attitude of gratitude is, you know, I like it all. I welcome it all. I, I welcome my losses just as much as my victories. Cause that's where we grow. And, but it is, it is exciting, you know, and, and I've learned not, I don't like to run too hot or too cold. You know, don't let the highs get too high. So it's really exciting, but it, it, you know, that's just not, Hey, let's celebrate. And I'll snap a picture and put it on Instagram, but you know, uh, the machine has to keep moving. So it's really exciting. And that just means I got to take care of myself even better because there's a lot of work. I'm gonna have to roll up my sleeves and, you know, gonna, gotta, gotta build it, gotta build it. So. Exactly. And, and like you said earlier, there's nothing to do, but to do it. eh? Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's now's the time, Steve. Now's the time. We have come to the question. I know you've been waiting for this question. I know you've been waiting for it. The time is now. The time is now. This is this is the question that matters. So, who would win a confrontation between a great white shark and a saltwater croc, and why? Me. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm cause I, cause I'm going to eat tonight. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't even eat. I don't even eat that stuff, but, um, uh, uh, the great white, the great white, cause the great white's the king of the ocean. You know, you come up on the king. There's a heavy price to pay for that. <laughs> there's a heavy price and I'm a stone cold killer. Stone cold killer. I have no emotions. You know, I don't care about your problems. <laughs> <laughs> You're in my space now. And you done pissed me off. 
you know, so today's your lucky day. <laughs> so we're going with great white. We're going to go yeah. with great white because it's I'm the king going of the with ocean. great white. Exactly. I like it, mate. I cannot argue with that, brother. I cannot argue with it at all. All right, Steve. Thank you very much for being on the show, my friend. Thank and you. I'm going to take it out with a go, Steve Cotter. That was the best closing ever. <laughs> Did you know that DTS Fitness Education are actually an education company? That's right. So if you like what you see and you would like a little more, go to dtsfitnesseducation.com and check out our live and online courses.